Good evening, everybody. My name is Nina Jane, and I am one of the um, programming librarians at the Cary Library. Very excited to bring you to the wonderful program with uh, Carol Orange, who you obviously know. And um, we, I will spotlight her in just a second. I just wanted to say a couple things. One is that um, you can buy Carol's book, A Discerning Eye, signed from Belmont, the only um, program description. Um, I'm hearing myself echo. Yeah, we hear you echo too. Okay. Can everybody mute themselves so that you don't hear my echo? an echo? Okay. So I was saying, you can buy Carol's book. She will sign it from Belmont Books um, that I will send out the information again in the um, recap. So um, you have that opportunity because as we all know, signed books are gold. Um, I wanna thank the library foundation, the Cary Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programs. We could not do these kind of programs without them. And I, as you know, we are recording this program and we will be doing a Q&A with Carol. Feel free to um, put your questions in the, Q, uh, in the chat and I will um, keep an eye on them and feed them to Carol as we go through this uh, program. So really quickly, I'm going to introduce Carol, um, who I actually wanna say, first of all, that Carol's sister, Marlene, contacted us to say, my sister wrote an amazing book and you should do a program with her. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Marlene is a longtime Lexington resident. So of course we love anything that has to do with local interest. So that was the starting point of this. And then we reached out to Carol and we're just like so happy that this worked out. Um, Carol has worked in the art world for more than 20 years. And she was the research editor for art books in London and later becoming, became an art dealer in Boston. She has an MBA from Simmons University and worked as a marketing manager at the Polaroid Corporation. Um, this is her first book, A Discerning Eye. And <clears throat> I thought this was really, um, Eugenia Peretz from Vanity Fair says about it, through its loving and lovable pro protagonist, A Discerning Eye takes the reader on a journey that's both tense and wonderful, wonderfully escapist. Carol's rich knowledge of art history and powers of visual description demonstrated throughout elevate the adventure into the realm of a John Le Carré sophistication. And, you know, I read that and I was just like, oh, boom, we're done. We're good. We're going to have Carol here. <laughs> so Carol is going to join me on screen and I will... I will start with a question. Welcome, Carol. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mina. It's a pleasure to be here and to see all these wonderful, friendly faces. I love it. <laughs> I'm so happy. Good. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, so I'm just going to start with a real softball. Please just tell us a little bit about yourself and your book, and then we'll go into details with questions from our participants, our, um, our attendees. Okay, so um, I lived in Boston for many years. Um, I lived in the South End and my sister Marlene lived in Lexington. So um, I have always been in love with art. Um, I think from a young age when our parents took us to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, we were very lucky that they did this. We had some close relatives who lived in New York. Our grandmother and her sisters who all lived in Manhattan. So um, in Boston, I had a gallery. Um, it was in the Fort Point Channel District, which is right near South Seaport. It was near the Children's Museum. And I had a gallery for, uh, I think about eight or nine years, I gave it up because the recession hit and lots of people owed me money and I didn't want to be in the art world to collect money. So the Gardner Museum was the place in Boston that I just adored and would go there whenever I possibly could. I mean, just to sit in the courtyard, to sit near the courtyard and 
you know, amongst all these beautiful plants and flowers, which my sister really loves because she's in the garden club of Lexington. Um, and, you know, with all the statuary and then to, you know, just sort of stroll around the rooms and see the marvelous art that Isabella Stewart Gardner selected originally for her home and then made it into a museum for everyone. So um, I, I was, you know, I mean, it was my favorite, favorite place. So when the robbery happened in 1990, March uh, 17th, actually it was March 18th. Uh, in, it was like one o'clock in the morning. I mean, I was devastated. How could people steal this art that belongs to us, belongs to the public? And so I had this idea in my head that you know, who, who would dare to do this? Um, I had this idea that it was, it was someone who went to a Harvard graduation, a foreigner, and the foreigner was taken to the Gardner Museum and said, oh, I like this and I like that and I like this and I like that. And they also noticed that the security there was not tip top. So I always had that idea in the back of my head. And I decided, um, you know, like 10 years later that I really wanted to write a book about it because no one that I knew of had analyzed the paintings that were stolen. You know, they, they looked at, they tried to find fingerprints, they tried to find all kinds of other um, clues, but they weren't successful. No one had ever looked at the paintings. So I analyzed the paintings and I came up with this idea that most of the paintings, almost all of them, had this tension between light and dark, and um, that that the thieves went out of their way to get certain paintings. So they stole, for example, three Degas drawings, you know, really charming drawings, mainly about jockeys on horseback, which is, was a Degas scene, but they left a Michelangelo. So they couldn't have been after the most valuable art in the museum. Um, although they did steal a Vermeer and there are only 36 Vermeers in this world. And the Vermeer that they stole from the gardener is just magnificent. It's, it's really um, a wonderful painting because the man playing the lute has his back to the audience and there's this whole mystery about who are the women on either side of him and what is the relationship between the three. I mean, if Vermeer had decided to paint the lute player in the front and, and you saw his face, it wouldn't have the same mystery. So anyway, the Vermeer is priceless, but they left behind uh, on the third floor, you know, even more priceless paintings, the Titian and um, uh, the Jato, which is considered the most valuable piece of art in the Gardner collection. So the protagonist, Portia Malatesta, is an idealized version of me. <laughs> and I made her Italian American because I have uh, a real warm spot in my heart for Italian Americans, um, for Italians period, but also Italian Americans. And so Portia is just determined to help get the paintings back. And I think I'll, I'll sort of stop there and see if there are any questions because, you know, then I can go into more about the book. So are there any questions, Mina? 
I do actually have the book here. I know it's backwards. <laughs> no, no, it's it's right. It is? Oh, okay, good. And my picture is backwards, but I love this cover. I have to say it's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I love the fact that you've written a book with a, the, the perspective of a, a, a historic, you know, somebody who's really an expert on historical, historical artifacts. So you were able to really look at it in a different way. Um, is that why, why you chose to write this particular story is because of your history? Yes, yes. Um, you know, I mean, it's definitely my love of art that led me to write this book and my, you know, horror that um, 13 art objects were stolen from this really special place, special place. I mean, you know, it's, it's spiritual as well as gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I just want to make sure I ask the right question. So I get a question um, about what was the easiest and hardest part of writing this book for you? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the hardest part was how to begin. I, I think I had like, 10 other ways that I began the book. And I did have an outline that I kept changing over time. Um, but the beginning, you know, you have to grab your readers in the beginning. And I really struggled with how, how to begin. In fact, chapter three is how I, it used to be chapter one. <laughs> so that, that was definitely, the hardest, the hardest part. Um, what was the easiest part? Uh, I, I guess the easiest part was that in analyzing the paintings, because it was like, I had, I knew that there were 13 art objects and I knew I had to analyze each one and sort of um, sort of prove my, um, my hypothesis about the um, fact that, you know, there's dark and light, there's a tension between dark and light in um, most of the paintings. There actually was only one that didn't have it. That was a Degas drawing. So, um, you know, that, that was the easiest part. Yes. Okay. Um, Alice says, I think this book could be a movie. What do you think? And I would like to add to that, who would play Portia in the movie if you had your choice? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, um, let's see. That's, that's a really, really good question. Um, who would play Portia? I think, well, my favorite actress, I think the most versatile actress is Kate Blanchett. And, you know, I'd love her to play Portia, although Portia is 38, and I think Kate may be a little bit older, but Kate is just so versatile. She, she can develop a character and make you care about this character from the get-go. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ellen says, she's only on page 20, and you've definitely grabbed her. <laughs> um, and Sharon says, I think it'd be as good as the Da Vinci Code, which, you know, if you can get Tom Hanks. Awesome. Oh, gee, <laughs> I, think, I think some of these people, some of my friends here are just a little bit prejudiced. But oh. I'll that. <laughs> We're going to pretend they don't know you at all. Um, <laughs> and your sister Marlene asks, what is your focus on the dark and light in the book? What's, do you um, have a sense of what that means? Oh, Yes. Well, I, my, what I said is that the person who was the mastermind behind stealing the paintings um, was someone who is tortured about the uh, dark and light in their own lives. And so the paintings reflected this. And that's why, and in particular, the Shea Tortoni by um, Manet, which is, you know, a man all dressed up in evening clothes, a top hat, evening clothes, and he's sitting at a table in a cafe and there's a half glass of wine 
and half, half of his face is shaded and you know the other but he his he looks like perplexed um and i think that painting more than maybe any of the other paintings spoke to the mastermind who decided that they wanted to have the paintings for their own use their own pleasure and you know so it was this tension that that spoke to him about art and life. Okay, um, so uh, somebody asked me that they haven't read the book yet, and they'd like to get sort of an overview. And I wanted to read this um, this review from uh, the author of Seven Houses and the Harem and the World Behind the Veil. I love Little Courtier. Carol Orange's A Discerning Eye is an intricate tale of art theft bolstering a sensational plot with finely crafted characters in evocative settings, an enthralling novel not only for suspense seekers and art connoisseurs, but everyone who enjoys a fabulous romp. I thought that Theta really did a pretty good job of encapsulating what it's about. It's not just about the art history um, theft, but actually her work, Portia's work, is it with the FBI, to, um, to use her theories on finding you know, the art. And, um, you know, that the FBI would actually understand that this has value to it. And so then she ends up like traveling in different places and going on kind of an adventure. And is that is that kind of the uh, overall picture? Yes. Um, so, yes. So Portia draws up a profile, a psychological profile of the thief based on her interpretation of the stolen paintings. And then through someone that she meets by accident in the public garden <laughs> um, in Boston, um, he introduces her to his college roommate who works for the FBI. And she goes to um, Washington to meet with the FBI. Um, first, actually, she meets the head of the art crime team in New York, and he's very uh, impressed with her analysis and also with the fact that she speaks fluent Spanish and that she has contacts in South America. So it just so happens the FBI did, um, they, they did some research and they found that her profile matched a profile in their database. And the, the um, person that they were most suspicious about um, lived in Medellin, Colombia. So for all of those reasons, they asked her if she would go with them to Medellin. And um, she does. So I, I don't know if I should tell the whole story because no, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's good. Um, I just I just wanted to sort of point out that it's not an esoteric book completely. It's really an adventure. It's really a mystery, um, and mm -hmm. and it's a it's an excellent take on the sort of canon of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum heist because it brings a different perspective. Right. Um, so Marilyn wants to know. Although you have a great knowledge of art history, how much additional research did you have to do? Oh, a lot. Um, um, you know, I mean, first of all, as, as although I know um, a fair amount about art, you have to be so precise and so exact uh, about the titles, who painted it, when they painted it, why they painted it. I mean, you really have to dig to, to really have an accurate and deep understanding. So I did a lot of research on the art and I also did um, a lot of research on the cocaine trade in Medellin, Colombia. Because even though um, I did in real life travel there <laughs> for Polaroid when I, when I worked for Polaroid, um, it was not it was before Pablo Escobar uh, ruined the country. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Terry says, 
She has the book and she's so looking forward to reading it. She loves the quiet times in the galleries as well as the Sunday afternoon concerts. Soon to get back to business, right? I do, of course, remember the theft and the speculation, the police work. Should I refresh my memory on the details before, you, before reading the book or should I do that after reading your fictionalized version? Oh, I think after. I, I, I think after because it is intended as, as mystery and, and there are lots of descriptions about the paintings, where they are in the Gardner, you know, all the other splendid parts of the Gardner Museum. So I, I think after. Yeah, I, I hope it whets your appetite. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, of course, we want to read more once we read a great book. Mm -hmm. Jackie says, so much has been written about the theft. Were you influenced by what others have written? No, I haven't. Um, I mean, I, I, I had this idea long before, you know, some of the nonfiction books came out. So I had this idea rolling around in my head long before that, but I did read all those books, all the nonfiction books. And, you know, it, I wasn't at all influenced because none of them um, ever had this theory. Interesting. Um, I think I was talking to some other authors a few weeks ago and they talked about also talking, doing a fictionalized version or view of a, some themes that everybody knows very a lot about. And they said that it was really interesting to find like that piece that nobody had looked at. You know, it was like sort of an aha moment for them. Right, right, right. exactly. So anyway, I mean, you know, I, I must say, I don't think that in the initial stages and I, of the theft or after the theft, um, I, I really don't know what was going on exactly, but it didn't seem like they had a coordinated effort between the police, the FBI, Interpol. It was, it was really discombobulated, mm. which is too bad. Definitely. Martha asks, um, she says, Carol, as you know, I read the book and loved it. Do you think yeah. that other art heists are psychologically motivated rather than financially? Um, Yes, I do. I think that there are some um, art thieves who, um, it's rare. I mean, most, most art thieves um, just steal what's closest to the door. But there was an article in the New Yorker and knowing Martha, she probably read it <laughs> because she's so well read. But I can't remember the guy's name but he, I know he was from Bosnia and he was, but he became a French citizen and he stole some artwork from the Musée de l'Art Moderne. And um, he, he had these incredible skills because in Mostra, the men jump off the bridge, um, you know, when they're, when they're young boys, they, they, they show their prowess by jumping off the bridge. So he was very adept at climbing walls, but the art that he stole was art that spoke to him. Um, and this was not so long ago, maybe two years ago that this happened. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I lost my spot. <laughs> um, Amy asks, um, is Portia gonna have more adventures? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm going, I'm in the middle of another book with Portia. I don't see that there's going to be a long series of Portia Malatesta books, because I think that after like two, then it becomes a little stale. But she is in the middle of another adventure, and she is working very closely with the FBI um, art crime team person, Julian Henderson. So yes, <laughs> exciting. Um, Gail says, while you were writing the book, did you go to the gardener and examine the rooms where the paintings once lived? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've been back there. I mean, even after I left Boston, every time I came back to Boston, I would always go to the gardener 
um, it was it was like a pilgrimage, and you know, not just because I was writing the book, um, but just because I loved it. But I have to say that um, in one trip that I made before the final version of the manuscript, I had made some mistakes, um, not about the paintings, but about like the stairways and what they look like. I had written about them from memory. And when I was actually there, I, I noticed that I had described them inaccurately, so. Oh, that's interesting that you're, you know, constantly revising in your head as you, um, as you travel through there again. Um, Gail also asks, um, says, she loved the conversations Portia had with Isabella. Can you talk about Portia's connections with Isabella? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is what, um, this was probably one of the most enjoyable um, experiences in writing because I just really let my imagination run wild. I mean, I had read all the history about Isabella, but having Portia and Isabella talk to one another was just so much fun. And it, it really, really was. And I was, there are parts, I, I shortened it there. there I, it went on and on and on because I had so much fun doing it. And then I realized for the sake of the manuscript, I had to cut some parts out, but they really did connect um, spiritually, artistically. They had the same kind of sensibility and also uh, a sense of adventure. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara says she loved the references to Car Cafe Budapest and the St. Botolph Club as well. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> um, the, the, uh, first of all, the St. Botolph Club, um, I have been there and some friends of mine in Boston are members there. And actually I am going to be talking there in January. Um, I don't know if they're going to be happy <laughs> when they read that chapter because <laughs> uh, that's when Portia is showing some art to mafioso collectors in the St. Patals Club. But um, uh, yeah, I love, love the St. Patals Club. I mean, this is old Boston at its best. And the, the Cafe Budapest, um, I do make their ice tart cherry soup. I have to say it's one of the most delicious recipes I've ever made. And the Cafe Budapest was also old, old Boston. So, yeah. Maybe you can um, share the recipe with us and I'll send it out to everybody in the recap. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, it's it's a guaranteed recipe. It surprises people that this soup, I mean, it is authentically Hungarian. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah asks, will your next book also be about stolen art? Yes, it will, but it, it will be very different. Um, you know, the artwork will not be analyzed per se. It's, it's the story of Nazi stolen art that Portia and Julian um, search for in a little German town. They're hired by um, a Cambridge family to find their patrimony that was lost during the Nazi era. But they go there in 1992 and they meet both people who are wonderful and want to help them. And they also meet people who want to uh, prevent them from finding it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I'm totally thinking about Monuments Men. Monuments Men? <laughs> <laughs> the movie. Anybody else see it? Was it just me? <laughs> I'm a huge George Clooney fan. Um, so I'm going to, while we're waiting for other questions about um, for anything, I wanted to ask you about your writing process because this is your first book, uh, first published book, I'll say, um, right. because I'm sure you've written much in the past. 
But how did you sort of like come across, come upon your writing style? Well, my favorite question to ask authors nowadays is, are you a planner or are you a pantser? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think originally I was pantser, but then in one of my <laughs> early writing groups, um, I met this woman who is totally a plotter and she taught me how to do an outline. And ever since Nancy taught me that, I, I have become a plotter because it really, I, I think it just makes your life easier. Mm -hmm. But the outline has changed um, a lot over time. And I, I had um, a whole section on a, I made one of the policemen a Chinese um, waiter. Actually, he was a delivery boy from a Chinese restaurant in Boston and he came from Hong Kong. And I did all this research on Hong Kong and why there was this migration to Boston from Hong Kong. And so I had this character and I kind of was crazy about him, but I had to cut him out. It, it just really detracted from, from the book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had him in the original outline, but I threw, had to throw it away. That's a shame because now he sounds really interesting. <laughs> I don't read about him. <laughs> um, so, but what, what, what made you decide to write a book? Any, like any book, like what, have you always been a writer? Have, has it always been an interest or once you left the art world um, job, did you, were you looking for something new to do? Okay, well, I think I've always been a writer and I've always been a reader. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to, um, my dad would say lights out and I turn on my flashlight in my bed so that I could finish the book I was reading. So um, I, it's, I worked at Random House um, when I came back from London, I went with my husband when we were very young. We had um, met at Cornell and he was getting his doctorate in political science. And I had this dream job uh, for a publishing house in London that published art books. So that, you know, was like everything all at once. I was a research editor, so I wrote uh, a small section uh, of the book, but mainly um, I worked with someone who was the expert in Spanish art, who later became the director of the Prado. So at, after I came back from London, um, we were living in Princeton and I said to my husband, I can't get a job in Princeton as a graduate student's wife. I'm going to commute to New York. And I wanted to work for Harry Abrams because they're um, art book publishers. But a friend of mine worked at Random House and she got me an interview. So I had this interview with this <laughs> curmudgeon <laughs> who I actually <laughs> really cared about. <laughs> he was very funny. <laughs> um, but he was a curmudgeon. He said to me, hmm, I never hire people as editorial assistants unless they went to Radcliffe. And I went, oh, well, that's not me. He said, but I'll let you have the job temporarily. I'm waiting for someone um, from Italy, actually. Um, and I said, okay, fine you know, because it was a job, I was going to be paid, I could commute from Princeton. And, you know, so that was my dream was to work in publishing. And, um, you know, I met really great writers, probably one of my favorite writers, um, William Styron. Uh, what? Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> um, you know, because Jason was, he was very, he was a very important editor and he, he really and truly was brilliant, but he was also a curmudgeon. Anyway, um, so I really intended to have a career in publishing, but then 
you know, we moved to Boston, Eric got a job there, and I spent six months at the Atlantic Monthly Press working for someone, again, as an editorial assistant, who was disappointing, shall we say. <laughs> so that was the end of my career in publishing. <laughs> And were you writing all this time like this? Were you working on this book at that time? No, 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 um, no. I mean, I, I wrote short stories. I was really intimidated about writing a novel. I wrote short stories and I've had two of them published, mm -hmm. but I was very, very intimidated about novels. I thought, OK, and, you know, I think I wrote short stories for many, many years. Okay. Um, so Gail asks, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, actually, to write the book, you know, because I had a full time job, it was it was about 10 years. Um, but wow. I was writing full time. You know, so mm -hmm. it, you know, I was I would come home very tired from my um, job. Um, and so I didn't have the energy to write, but no matter how tired I was, I could always read. So uh, I'm just an avid reader. As I see Jerry Becker is here and she knows what an avid reader I am. <laughs> um, so Sharon comments, um, could there be a short story about the delivery person, which I'm on board as, for as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could, I could. I could turn, I could write, I could use that as a short story. I could, I think I have it somewhere in one of my computers. <laughs> <laughs> a little outtake. Um, so Barry asked a question that I think is really interesting. Um, do you think that the theft will ever be solved? I do, I do. I'm, I'm very hopeful that the progeny of whoever it was that stole it will discover it um, and the reason that we'll discover the stolen art, um, you know, I think it was not too long ago that um, in Munich, the son, uh, again, I don't recall the names, I should have them at my fingertips. I know his first name was Cornelius, but it was the man who was one of Hitler's right hand people who, you know, he looked to to secure all all this art that belonged largely to um, wealthy Jewish people, but also um, just you know people in Germany. And his son, um, after he passed away, his son had the art, and I think there was something like twelve hundred pieces of art in his apartment in Munich. So, you know, um, that was discovered and the art is slowly being restored to the original owners, if they can find them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think something like that's gonna happen. I, I really do. I think, you know, my guess is with, so it's been 30 years, um, my guess is in the next 10 years. Hmm. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take some bets on that. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you wanted to read a short passage from the book so we can um, enjoy that. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll read a very short passage. Um, it's called The Day After. It had been almost nine months since Antonio had died. And many nights after Alexa was asleep, Portia tiptoed into the library and replayed his saved phone messages. Hi, Portia, it's me calling to check in with you. Hearing his voice lent credence to her fantasy that Antonio was still alive. When she awoke the next morning, the bleak reality made her weep until Stansky comforted her in his arms. She was grateful to him and also to Alexa, who made her laugh with imitations of Mr. Snow, her hapless math teacher. 
Yet while encouraging her artist's creativity brought her great satisfaction during her workday, recurrent nightmares about her house burning down unnerved her. On this chilly March afternoon, Portia closeted herself in her gallery. Her office space offered warmth and comfort. She was doing what she did best, moving photographs of artist's work around her desk as she designed the new show. The gallery was officially closed with phones switched off, a good time to organize Stockwell's April show. He promised to finish his large evocative landscapes, even if it meant staying up late for the last few nights. While the misty tinge of his abstractions might remind collectors of Mark Rothko, they acknowledge Stockwell's gestural brushstrokes could only be his. Portia's exhibition space served as a home for 10 emerging artists, paintings, lithographs, drawings, and sculptured. She employed three 20-something art history graduates who impressed potential buyers with their knowledge. And she felt proud when her artist shows were well-reviewed in the Boston Globe and Art News. After two years of struggle, the gallery had finally hit an upward swing Though so far, none of her artists had become famous. Toward the end of the day, Portia reached for a pile of bills that lay on her desk. Underneath the top envelope was Monday's Boston Globe. The lead headline jumped out. 200 million Gardner Museum art theft. Two men posing as police tie up night guards. With shaky hands, Portia continued reading the story, running one finger down the list of stolen art. A mention of Vermeer's masterpiece, the concert, stopped her. Placing her elbows on the desk, she covered her forehead with her hands. No, 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 she shouted at the empty room. <laughs> Oh. So that, that artwork is supposedly worth a billion now. Mm -hmm. That was lovely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> um, Amy asks, what was your process to get your book published? Oh, well, that, that was a long process. I won't go into the uh, ups and downs of that, but I did find this wonderful small publisher in New York called Kevin Bridge Press. And um, I'm really, really happy with them because when you work with a small publisher, you, you can have a say in the cover. And I, I really am so pleased with the cover and um, things like that. <laughs> Thank you, Mina. <laughs> I also really love the cover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mina. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, so many people do write and write well, but um, it's it's difficult to get published, I, I feel yeah. like. Yes, it so is. Something, it, something it must have sparked that. It's, it's very, very um, difficult to get published. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I had one agent who told me how much she loved the book and how she came very close to accepting it. But at the last minute, she just couldn't see a game plan for it. So those, those are the most painful um, kinds of rejections. <laughs> but yes, yeah. uh, I mean, like everything in life, you know, publishing a book is full of rejections and you have to, as an author, you have to weigh them and say, well, you know, that means this wasn't going to be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. Well, Gail asked a really good question um, about marketing. What, what's marketing been like during COVID? Because it can't, your book came out in October, so right. right in the middle of it. Right. No, um, it, it's much harder to market a book. Um, you know, I'm very energetic, so I was really going to um, get on planes and go 
to Boston for sure and New York um, and you know go to all the possible venues and do readings and um, you know I couldn't do that. I mean Zoom is really wonderful in the sense that there's my cousin Mark from Berkeley, California. <laughs> And, you know, I was planning to also come to California, that's for sure. But, you know, it, it, it definitely makes it much harder. I mean, well, COVID has made our, all of our lives harder, mm -hmm. right? Right. Well, and there are a lot of um, authors that postpone or publishers that postponed books coming out because of COVID. But, you know, with sort of no immediate end in sight, how long can you go for that? Right, right. I mean, Zoom, I think, has certain advantages, like, you know, you, you can attract people from all over the country. But as Mina and I discussed a little bit before this, I, I think, you know, the one thing that I really miss is the live exchange that you have with people before and after any kind of reading or presentation. Those you know, little conversations that are so meaningful. Mm -hmm. I really miss that. Yeah, I mean, it, but I mean, I guess Zoom is, has been fine and, and actually really rewarding for me in terms of like connecting re authors with readers that you might not normally get to see because of distance or, you know, travel and things like that. Right. So you said you're an, um, an avid reader and we're almost, out of time, but I did want to ask, what books would you recommend to us to read? Oh, you mean contemporary authors today? What do you love to read? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I love all the books by Graham Greene. I've read all of them several times. He has an extraordinary sense of place. You really feel like you're there. My favorite novel that he wrote was Quiet American, and it took place in Vietnam as the um, French were leaving and the Americans were starting to get involved. So also his characters are, are just, they're three-dimensional, you know, they're really fascinating. They stay with you. And um, my favorite film of all time was based on a Graham Greene novel. It's called The Third Man. And um, I just, I, I've seen it, I think, 10 times. And I could see it again. I mean, just you're in post-war Vienna and you hear the music, you meet the characters, you know, and you're, you're just, you know, you know, it's a divided city and then the drama that he creates about Harry Lyme, um, this American character played by Orson Welles <laughs> and uh, just, just so amazing. So you, you are in the sewers of Vienna with Harry Lyme as he's running for his life. So I think I think Graham Greene to me is the most evocative writer. Um, he also has a sense of morality that I resonate to. I mean, he also thinks about good and bad, like I thought about light and dark. Um, and, you know, so the, his main characters are, are very concerned about they're not perfect by any means, but they want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Shirley asks, do you have any idea how long your next book might take? And I would like to know when you think it'll come out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think the second book is definitely gonna take, I'm, I'm already halfway through the first draft um, and it, it definitely will not take. 10 years, I'll never do 10 years again. <laughs> so it'll, it'll probably be, um, I'm guessing and I'm hoping for two years, I'm gonna try and do it in two years. And now I'm devoting myself totally to writing. Awesome. I actually have, um, oh wait, um, how long from finishing it does it take to publish? Oh, I think, um, you know, it depends 
on the publisher. I mean, that's another advantage of working with a small press. They can publish much more quickly than, you know, small, than large publishers mm -hmm. who are more bureaucratic. So I, I'm guessing that from a finish, finished manuscript to a published book is about a year. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So not as bad as In we thought. In some cases, it's two years. It depends on, you know, the situation. Right. So um, my last question for you is, this is silly. Um, what is your favorite story from your art dealer days? Oh, my favorite story from my art dealer days. Okay. Um, I was with my husband and daughter. We were in Montreux, Switzerland, and we met this guy named Pierre Keller. <laughs> and I, he was, um, you know, I was sourcing a lot of art that I was selling in the US. I was sourcing it in Europe. And Pierre Keller was quite, quite the character. I mean, he was really colorful. And um, I don't know if I could tell you the whole story, but <laughs> the chair that my daughter sat on was <laughs> very artistic, shall we say. Um, I but almost sat on it. I didn't <laughs> sit on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was informed it was art and it was suspended from the ceiling. <laughs> so more like a swing, right? <laughs> Not even. And it was like Andy Warhol's installation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he did, he did, um, he had all these unbelievable um, posters from the Jazz Festival in Montreux done by really great artists. And, you know, like Keith Herring and um, Nikki Sanfal and um, Yves Tangui. I mean, they were just spectacular. So, you know, it was a real find to meet him, but we had quite an hysterical time there. I just thought that's such a fascinating field to me and using, you know, I just wondered if maybe some of the stories that were from, you know, your time there ended up in, in some ways in, in your book, because that would make it more sort of real to life. No, um, well, um, I did have, most of them weren't, no, most of it was made up. Um, there were some real artists. I, I used their real names like Anne Thornycroft, who is still a very dear friend of mine. She lives in Los Angeles and I have her artwork and I did represent her when, when I had my gallery. And uh, also Sterling Mulberry who lives in the Boston area. So I, I do mention them in the book and really it's to honor them because mm -hmm. I still love their art and I still love them. Well, you really bring such a rich history to Wait, <laughs> a discerning eye, um, which, you know, just comes, it just flies off the page, really, um, that authenticity, I think. Um, and so I'm going to end there, but I am, at, I'm, I'm going to say thank you, first of all, Carol, for um, staying, you know, doing this and being so wonderful to work with and to hear your stories has been amazing. I love the fact that you have so many friends and family here and for, and for that, I thought I'm going to turn the recording off, but if people want to stay and hang out and chat a little bit, please feel free to do so. Um, and because I think that there are a lot of people here that Carol would love to chat with. So thank you so much for tonight. And um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn off the